my mantra in life is always just why not? Like try something new, go for it. You really, you only live once. YOLO. I think YOLO is universal. And I say that as a, I guess, a very old millennial, 1980. Just go for it. You know, if you've been sitting on the idea, why not just take a risk? I mean, what's the worst that can happen? Welcome to the Torpreneur Podcast. Travel industry veteran Shane Whaley will take you on a journey with fellow torpreneurs, sharing their tips, ideas, insights, and success stories to inspire you to make your tour business the best it can be. And now, here is your host, Shane Whaley. Hello, everybody, and welcome to the Tourpreneur Podcast. Today, we are talking with a tourpreneur. Lauren Herpich, who runs Local Food Adventures, which is a guided walking food tour company that provides Oakland tours and East Bay cultural food experiences. Welcome to Tourpreneur, Lauren. Thanks, Shane. Happy New Year. Happy New Year to you. It's fantastic to have you on the show. I'm really intrigued to find out more about your tour. So let me ask you, first of all, how did you get started? I fell in love with giving tours as a campus tour guide during my undergraduate days. I was a tour guide at the University of Arizona in Tucson, and I absolutely loved it. But I will say I never thought that I'd actually become a professional tour guide. I went off and I was a news producer in Washington, D.C. for a number of years and worked in television in marketing and communications. When I went off to Chicago, I got my master's in marketing from Northwestern University I was looking for a part-time job, something that would get me more into the city of Chicago, make me a little bit extra money to help pay my rent and pay off some student loans. And I went on Craigslist and I found a food tour guide position listed with a Chicago-based company. And it was the perfect fit for me. I thought, okay, I can find all of the great places to eat in Chicago, have someone pay me to do that and make a little bit extra money. So um, I did that for a number of years. I kept doing that when I got my kind of quote unquote real corporate job after graduation, because I just loved doing it so much. Um, It was so great meeting new people, showing them around. Again, it was just, it kind of fit into what I loved about being a campus tour guide. When my husband and I actually, we met while I was giving tours It fit very well because he loves to golf. And so he would go golfing on a Saturday morning. I would do my tours and then we'd get together later and I'd tell him all the places that he needed to take me on dates. So it also, it worked out really well, but we wound up moving out here to the Bay Area and we landed in this amazing neighborhood um, in Oakland called Rockridge. I was consulting out of our apartment, working by myself. And I hope from anybody who's met me and from the tone of my voice today that I love talking to people. So being on my own and kind of solo consulting was really a drag. And so every day, you know, to kind of break up the day, I would take my reusable bag, hit College Avenue, and I would literally just go up the street and I would stop at the bakery and get some bread for sandwiches. And I'd stop at the butcher shop, have them slice my deli meat. And I would just get to know everybody on the street. And one day we were having dinner with some friends and they said, yeah, we just took this really cool food tour over in San Francisco. And my husband later that night said, you know, Lauren, you really loved being a food tour guide in Chicago. Why don't you just start one here? You've literally gotten to know everybody on the street. And, you know, it'd be a great way to make some extra cash and kind of get a little bit more ingrained in the community since we were relative newbies. So I started it literally as a side project. Six months later, got pregnant with our son. And, you know, my husband travels so much for work. He's in tech sales. We often joke that his office is at 36,000 feet on an airplane. We don't have family out here. So it just made sense for me to own my own business so that I can have that balanced life between, you know, raising our kid, but then also feeling more fulfilled and having a professional outlet and starting my own thing. So um, local food adventures, yeah, it's just, it, it's been an amazing experience for me as a professional, but then also um, for my personal life. I love hearing about people who have a passion for the tour. And that's what got me interested in starting to open in the first place. It's like people who have that passion for a topic and then build tours around it and, after a lot of hard work, are able to make a living at it as well. Because I think you'd started some businesses before outside of tours, correct? Yeah, that's correct. How did you feel about starting up your own tour business? Because I think when you're a tour guide for someone else, you don't have all that responsibility. 
Uh, but when you do start up on your own, obviously, I mean, I'm saying obviously, but were you scared? Did you have any fear? Oh, yeah. I mean, you think about it. I mean, I'm starting a tour in Oakland, California, first off, which Oakland is not the main destination in the Bay Area. Most people come out to the Bay Area and they go to San Francisco. Oakland had a bad rap and it still kind of does outside the area. But when we moved here, I quickly realized how amazing this city was. I mean, in fact, here's an interesting story. We moved the first year that the Golden State Warriors won the NBA Finals. And part of the tradition of any major league you know, team, professional sports team, winning their league championship is that they have a parade. They won and they paraded in Oakland and they the parade route took them around Lake Merritt, which is actually found right in the center of the city. And I remember my mom calling me saying, and and I played basketball in high school as a kid. So I'm a very, we're a very knowledgeable basketball family. My mom, she said, you know, Lauren, I thought the Warriors were in Oakland. Um, I said, yeah, mom. She goes, well, where were they parading? Because that was a beautiful lake that they were around. And I said, mom, that's Oakland. There's just all these little gems that part of what I love doing and part of the reason why I'm you know, so excited to have my business here in Oakland is because I'm allowing people to kind of see that Oakland isn't that scary city that a lot of people think it is. Um, it's a beautiful city with so much culture, diversity, and vibrancy. But starting off, you know, especially five years ago, people were still like, why would you start a food tour in Oakland? Who would actually come on this tour? That has kind of led me to figure out who my core demographic is right now and then how we can, and working with um, our uh, CVB, Visit Oakland, you know, how we can get more people to come and experience the city because it really is great. Never miss an episode of the show. Subscribe at torpreneur.com forward slash subscribe. And how did you go about Getting the word out, first of all, so you decide to do this and and you make your itinerary, etc. And then how did you market it initially? I looked at myself as I was a traditional tourism company. My first thought was, well, okay, if I give tours, where should I be listed? So I listed myself on TripAdvisor. I immediately went around to all the local hotels, dropped off rack cards, you know, kind of looking at it as that traditional business. In fact, the first six months of giving tours, I started my tour at the foot of the East Bay's most prominent hotel, thinking, okay, this is where I'm going to get my tour guests. They're going to be staying at the hotel and they're going to want to come and take a tour with me. It was really slow going. I was getting, you know, maybe two people, you know, one tour and one person, one tour. I can't tell you how many one person tours I did during those first six months. I want to have a successful business, but I got to kickstart it a little bit. So I did what a lot of you know early tourpreneurs do. We took out a Groupon. I thought it would be a really great way of getting the word out. I'll admit I was a Groupon user when I was in Chicago, especially as a poor grad school student. I use Groupon all the time. It was a great way to get the word out, but I made absolutely no money. So that is something to definitely kind of share with other tourpreneurs. I look at Groupon. It's a great platform to maybe promote yourself at the beginning, but it's very hard to kind of get yourself out of that trap. What I looked at was, okay, my, I might not have made much money on the Groupon, but I, what I got was a lot of knowledge and data on who my customer was. And what I found was that it's locals who are coming on my tours. It wasn't necessarily the traveler. Locals were people in the city, newbies who had just moved here, just like we had, were using my tours to kind of discover Oakland people in sort of the further out suburbs. So we have suburbs like Walnut Creek and Pleasanton who, you know, even they're like, well, I don't know if I want to go all the way to Oakland, but if I have a tour guide that takes me around, that makes me feel a little bit more comfortable. They were coming on my tours and literally, again, I might not have made much money, but it truly kind of set in motion the trajectory of my business and how I've been able to grow it really well. I mean, we've grown 50% year over year, over year, over year. It's been really helpful, but you know, it was, it was hard, especially at that beginning thinking, oh my God, this is not going to work. How did you get over that? I think this is a really important question because I think most entrepreneurs feel the same way. They either start out with a meetup or waiting for the phone to ring or email orders to come in. What was your mindset at that time when you were struggling? Well, all right. So I looked at who was using the Groupon 
And I saw that it was older women, predominantly maybe their 50s, early 60s, empty nesters. So people who their kids are already out of the house, they have a little bit more disposable income because those college bills are paid. And they were looking for something fun to do on the weekends with either their girlfriends or their significant others. I had one private tour contact me, a private group contact me, and I did a tour for them. And I quickly saw the amount of money I can make on one tour versus just leading a tour of one or two or three people. So I said, okay, well, if we want this to work, we need to go after larger groups that fit my demographic. So literally I stayed up late at night and I just Google searched every women's organization in a 30 mile radius of Oakland. So I'm looking at junior league organizations, women's clubs at local country clubs. My mother-in-law, she is a member of a country club and her women's group does activities all the time together. I'm thinking, okay, these are ladies with money who want to do something fun. Why aren't they spending their money with me? So I literally spent about a hundred dollars on a flyer very personalized. It had my picture on it. I hand wrote my signature saying, hope to have you guys on a tour. And I literally mailed it. I I used mail. And that's something that a lot of people don't talk about anymore is, you know, good old fashioned snail mail. And with that hundred dollars of flyer prints and postage, I had three private tours come back to me and I think it was like $6,000 in revenue. So the ROI was amazing. And then after that group would do a tour, I'd send them a handwritten note and say, thank you so much. If you can refer me to another group that you're a member of or other friends, please do. And they have. And so it just has, it spiraled that way. Sure. No, that, that's very smart. I like that approach. And then in terms of, you know, your main product, which is obviously the food tour, how did you go about setting up, you know, or creating relationships with the different food vendors in, in Oakland? Well, I mean, I was, I had the benefit because I was their customer. So they knew me like every day I'd be going there, you know, I'd go to Verbrugge Butchers to pick up deli meat and then our dinner that night. And I'd go in and I'd say, Hey, Ernesto, like, how are you? And Jerry's the owner. And so in talking to Jerry, he knew who I was. And I said, Hey, Jerry, I'm thinking of starting a food tour. Do you want to be on? And he's like, well, what's a food tour? That was a big thing too, of trying to explain to people what food tours are. And I have to say, even though we're a pretty growing industry, there's still a lot of people out there that don't even know what a food tour is. And a lot of that are people who could potentially be your partner. So restaurants and butcher shops and specialty shops. And for me, I wasn't like an outsider coming in because I think especially here in the Bay Area, I remember one conversation that I had with a potential partner and they actually became a partner was I think that they've gotten burnt a little bit by a lot of sort of more tech focused companies that come in and promise them business and, you know, say, all you have to do is give a discount and it does, it hasn't worked well for them. And I feel like I've been able to turn around and say, no, listen, I'm a member of your community. I'm personally bringing you guests. This isn't on a digitized platform. I think a lot of it has just been, it's been, you know, it, it takes time, but you know, I think it's totally worth it. Yeah. And I, and I feel the best marketing for food tours is actually, people who go on their first food tour. So I did that in Toronto a first couple of months ago and I really loved it and I recommended it. And now wherever I go, I'm looking for a food tour because I had such a good experience. But with that comes a lot of pressure as well because if someone comes on a food tour and let's say it's not a great tour, that also affects the industry, doesn't it? Oh, absolutely. But I think that's something that tourpreneurs need to remember is that you're not going to please everyone. Everyone has a different opinion. So as long as you feel like, you know what, I did my best you put together a really good product, you treat your customer well, there's only so much that you can do. You can't please everybody. No, and I loved what you did. Uh, I was going to bring this up later in the conversation. There was one review I saw of you, admittedly from 2017, where someone said the meeting place was wrong and there was no list for the food tours. And I loved how you responded to that because first of all, you were authentic, you were apologetic and you said, yeah, we've just started the tour. There was a mix up, I think it was with Groupon or Living Social, whoever. You weren't defensive about it. You just set out, yeah, there were some issues that day. And I thought, great, that's what we need to see more of. I will say, I think becoming a mom has really helped me with this is that we're human. People make mistakes. And I feel like I've been able to have more patience with other people and just realize, okay, things happen. There's always, you know, we're human. There's only so much that we can do. So I think 
as long as we're honest. And again, I think that's something that I want to really show is that my business, it's, it's not a huge corporation. It's not a huge conglomerate. It's me and you know my tour guides that work with me. And you're dealing with locals. Yeah. I mean, I want someone to feel like, you know what? Yeah, there, there was a mistake and she owned up to it. And you know, the nice thing is that person who did write that review, because I know exactly the review you're talking about, he's actually been on two of my two other tours since I've launched them. So I was able to win him back. Well, you won him back because you were honest. And that's what I liked about the response. And I think that's the key takeaway for all entrepreneurs. Because, you know, we all say, oh, you should have a thick skin. But what I've learned through doing entrepreneurs is that your tours are your babies. And when someone's critical, it is hard to take, especially when you put your heart and soul into it. And in this instance, something, you know, had gone wrong with the info. But when you, when tourpreneurs get that feedback, when everything's gone right, then I feel for tourpreneurs think, wow, that person had such a high expectation. But like you say, same with this podcast, and everybody likes every episode, I get some criticism and I accept most of it. Still hurts though, isn't it? Oh, absolutely. But you know what? Those are the things that point out the things that you need to fix. For me, one of my biggest challenges is how to keep all the information straight on all the different platforms. And, you know, I got to meet Christian Watts at Magpie and his rep, Sarah, who she's so sweet and so nice. And they've been trying to get me on the Magpie platform forever. I promise in 2020, I will do it guys, but it's hard. You need kind of services like that to kind of help to keep all the information straight. But sometimes it's not until someone calls you out on it that you know, oh crap, like that information is wrong on Groupon or on even Fair Harbor. I mean, I try to keep all of my information up to date and correct on my website, but then that also means I need to have that information up to date and correct on Fair Harbor. And that's who my booking system is. So there's a lot of different places that you have your information there. Sometimes, you know, you can't keep track of all of it. And it takes, unfortunately, sometimes a customer calling you out saying, hey, this isn't right, but then you can fix it, you know, and that's it. Absolutely. At what point did you start offering online bookings? Right away. I knew that was that was essential for me. So I actually started with another booking system when I first started. I had been referred to them by a friend who does tours in San Francisco. But at that point, this is now 2014, they had some limitations on what they can do. And I think it might have just been their ears might have been ringing, but I got a call from Fair Harbor and they said, Hey, listen, we want to show you our platform. And Bob, I I will always credit Bob because Bob at Fair Harbor, his customer service was amazing. If you think about it, I am a very, very little tourpreneur compared to a lot of other people. And I remember it was November of 2014 over the Thanksgiving holiday. And we probably talked every day and he was showing me the platform. He had already kind of done the work integrating onto my system just to kind of show me the test to see what it would look like. I said, you know, your customer service is amazing. Like, absolutely, let's do this. And and even now, especially as they've gotten bigger, it's, it's definitely become more squeaky wheel gets the grease. So I kind of have to reach out a little bit more. But I will say anything that I've asked for, they've been able to put together. And that's been really great. But yeah, Bob at Fair Harbor truly, truly got me on their platform. Fantastic. Well, I know a lot of the Fire Harbor directors listen to Tourpreneur, so get, give Bob a pay rise if you're listening, right? <laughs> it's totally, totally. There. Want to connect with other Tourpreneurs? Then join our Facebook group at tourpreneur.com forward slash Facebook. So when you were looking at booking platform partner, what was top of mind for you? What did they really need to do in order to win your business? Other than having really good responsive account management, what were you looking for? Well, I think it's just the capabilities. Like, all right, so I'll admit, um, so my background, marketing, communication, and it's been with Fortune 100 companies and very notable companies that most people probably would have heard about. So even though I'm a small business owner, I kind of, I have the fortunate ability of bringing a lot of corporate knowledge to my business. I kind of knew the possibilities of what I can bring to my food tour. I wanted to have a booking system that could help create that. So The thing that I wasn't getting with the original booking system that I used was just even the ability of selling gift cards. They weren't doing that. Being able to do that with Fair Harbor has been great. Even with the promotional codes and campaigns, I love that, you know, sometimes it is a little overwhelming. They do have a very robust platform. But if you're able to think big and think of, you know, more creative ways to get your tours out there, 
the platform actually allows you to do that. So it's almost, it can be as simple as you want it to be, but it can be also be as complicated as well. I know a lot of our listeners are at that point where they want to work with a booking platform provider, but there's 160 plus out there now. So it's, it's a big decision because you don't want to pick one and then move around in your tour business. I'll say with that chain though, I mean, I get calls all the time from a lot of booking companies and there have been days, especially when I felt like I wasn't getting the attention because I am small and I know that Fair Harbor would have probably a, let's say, I don't know, I was feeling very down on myself thinking, oh, I'm small enough. I'm not getting the attention that I like, especially because I've been with them for so long. I joined 2014. So five years ago, I think I'm one of the first 10% of tours to join Fair Harbor. But when other booking companies call, right now, I love Fair Harbor. I'm not moving. But they still kind of have to win business. They, you know, There's other people calling. And you know, right now, I'm not changing my booking system is not a priority for me. But at the same time, too, I think booking systems should know that you're always earning our business. And there's always someone out there who can, who can come and maybe take your business away. So they should be mindful of that. <laughs> yes. Did you watch the uh, Res Tech debate at Arrival? I did. What was your what was your feeling uh, having attended that? Clearly they know that there is opportunity with tour operators and they're all trying to get piece of the pie. I think unfortunately you kind of see it with any sort of debate when you're kind of the big fish everyone attacks you and I think the way that you handle that can come across as being, you know, really supportive or really put offing. I don't know. I think it's Again, one of the big things I like to share with my fellow tourpreneurs when I talk to them, I mean, that's one of the things I love about going to Arrival and other conferences that I've been to is that you really get to, you know, you talk with your, your fellow tourpreneurs and for me specifically to talk to my fellow food tour operators. And one of the big things that I always like to say is, you know, your business and your market best. Everyone has different needs and everyone has a different goal. Not everybody is looking to be a big brown bus company or horn blower cruises. You know, some people are really happy with, I just want my small little tour in, you know, upstate New York or in Ohio. And that's great. I think when it comes to booking systems, you know, you know what works best for you. And, you know, I think it's finding just the right partner that can help you get there. What I got out of that that debate, to be honest with you, is how hungry they all are for your business. So even though you're saying you're on the smaller end of things, all of those people on the stage want your business. And the fact you're getting calls from these companies is, you know, that they want to win your business. Oh, absolutely. And I think, you know, and that's something that I love Fair Harbor. I've been touting them forever. I will say I just got a new account manager and, you know, she has definitely made all the difference. I was not very happy with my last account manager. And so when I was getting calls from peak peak especially they were they were very they were very aggressive but and i just I, I, it was not something i had on my to do list you know from a priority standpoint fair harbor or whoever whatever platform you're working with they need to know that you can change at any moment i don't think i complained enough to fair harbor that they changed my account manager but i'll just say gina at fair harbor you're awesome so far we've been working together for the last since actually arrival and so far so good so Great to hear. Let's change tracks a little bit. So I'm curious to know, when, when you started out, did you just start with the one tour? Because looking at your website, I can see you have five tours right now that you offer, excluding the, the private tours, I guess. When did you start opening up more tours? So I started my business with the Rockridge Food Tour, since that was the neighborhood that we were living in 2014. I expanded. So actually, my company was called literally just Rockridge Food Tour, and it was rockridgefoodtour.com. I added my second tour, which was an ice cream and gelato tour, the summer of 2015, because I was pregnant and I was eating a lot of ice cream. But also, I think I was getting very much in that kid mentality. And something that I was noticing, even with my own friends, you know, I saw that it was mostly older women coming on my tour. And I said, no one my age is coming on my tour. But what I saw was that people my age, we don't spend money on ourselves really, we spend it on our kids. I thought, how can I combine my sudden cravings of ice cream to a money-making venture? And so I created an ice cream and gelato tour, and that's super kid-focused. I wanted, you know, just to also have the opportunity of bringing kids into the mix because typically with food tours, you know, it's really just kind of an adult-centric. 
um, tour, especially like the traditional like three hour, six stop format. So with the ice cream tour, it's one hour, three stops, you know, they get history along the way. And kids leave very happy. And I think parents leave happy too, because they've done something really fun and unique with their kids together. And then that following year, we had really good friends who live in a different neighborhood in Oakland that's completely different than Rockridge. And it's um, near that beautiful Lake Merritt that I talked about earlier. And I thought, oh, this would be a cool neighborhood too. So that one launched January of 2017. Then I changed my name to Local Food Adventures. Why did you make the change? Because I wasn't just Rockridge anymore. I wanted people to know that I was hitting a couple more neighborhoods. And then also, I, you know, having that local in my name, you know, it really... Because again, that's... My customers are local right now. Let's just say, as of now. <laughs> yeah, and I'm, I'm impressed you got that domain, localfoodadventures.com. I know, I know. I'm surprised that it wasn't out there. It's funny, choosing a name was really hard. I mean, I remember sitting by myself and... I have a you know a whiteboard in our office at home and I was throwing names out there and I'm telling you I have the best husband in the entire world because he is the most logical calming street shooter guy and he just said Lauren what do you want to provide and I'm like well I'm providing food to locals but I want it to be fun you like like an adventure and he's like well why don't you just create, call it local food adventures I'm like Oh, genius. <laughs> Absolutely. No, I like it. And now you, you have five tours. And how many tour guides do you employ now? I have two amazing women that work for me. And they've actually been with me for four years. Um, so Linda and Deborah, I love you guys so much. They're just amazing women. They're both, they both live in Oakland. Deborah is a bartender, server. She's been in the restaurant industry for years. Linda has her own dog walking business and she's been a tour guide in Italy and in Virginia in the Virginia wine country. These are two extraordinary women who, you know, love food. They're local. They know about the neighborhoods. And, you know, I think what I appreciate about them is that they're along for the ride. So I think they're two women who understand the realities of my business right now. Like we're not bringing in millions of dollars. They kind of look at it as Linda said to me, she goes, Lauren, if I can make enough money from you to like go on an awesome extended weekend getaway every year, I'm happy. It's really great because it also kind of takes a little bit of the pressure off of me too, you know, but I kind of consider them family. I mean, I hired them when I was pregnant because I knew I didn't want my business to end. But when I was giving tours at seven and eight months pregnant, I just knew like, I'm not going to be able to do this for much longer. And I'm definitely not going to be able to do this with a newborn. I wanted to get some other people involved and, you know, I found them. I did literally a Craigslist ad. It was, I listed it kind of like an open audition. And I said, I'm going to be sitting outside the grocery store in Rockridge between these hours. If you're interested, bring your resume and sit down with me and let's talk. And I remember with both of them, Linda has experience giving tours. Deborah never gave a tour in her life, but I can tell from both of them, they're just extremely genuine people. And that's what I wanted out of great tour guides. I feel like you can almost teach anybody how to give a good tour, but to have a warm, genuine person that's going to be great with people, that's not something you can teach. Moving on to your website. I love it. It's very vibrant. It's very clear. I know instantly what you do. I can find all your tours. And that's not always the case with tour sites. Sometimes it takes a lot of clicking around. Did you build the, the website yourself? I did. So thank you so much, Shane. I really appreciate you just saying that. <laughs> no, because I, I know how difficult it is. I have the benefit of having that background from my previous life. And prior to starting my food tour company, I was trying to launch a website. So it was, I think when you move to the Bay Area, you think, oh, I got to create some sort of website and be in tech. And I had created a women's empowerment site called Why Not Girl. Um, And I had learned how to build my own website. And, you know, I remember taking an HTML class in 1998 in college. I kind of had the basics, but I knew that WordPress was a great platform. And I literally just downloaded a template um, using WP Zoom, which is a great template provider. And so, yeah, I built it myself. And that's something I really pride myself on because I almost... Until now, I can say I've done everything myself. That's something that gives me really personal fulfillment. 
Absolutely. I also like your video. Uh, you have a one minute video, which really describes what you do at local food adventures. I thought that was very well made. Oh, thank you. That was something I did not do myself. I did hire a friend to do that. <laughs> right. So she came along with her camera and you just, how did you prepare for that? Because I know a lot of other tour operators would love to have a video on their site, but most of us were a little scared to get in front of a camera. Yeah, well, you know, I, I think it helped working in television for a long time. I mean, I was predominantly behind the scenes in the producing end. It's nice being in the spotlight every so often. But no, it's funny. The photographer that did that was actually a client of mine when I was consulting when we first moved to the Bay Area. So I was doing some marketing consulting and I met Mike. He has a small shop over in the peninsula and I got to meet him and we kind of did a barter system, to be honest with you. So I gave him free marketing and PR advice. I helped kind of develop his website a little bit and he offered to shoot my first promotional video. And so that's kind of how it worked. Yeah. And I mean, I, I hear that a great deal. And why not if you have the services you can offer? I particularly liked that it was just one minute. Of course, I was interested to watch it because I knew we were chatting. But if I was from the public, I'm not a video marketing expert at all. But I think I like the fact it was just just over one minute. Yeah. No, I mean, that's I think the attention span nowadays is, you know, one minute is ideal. Two minutes you can kind of get away with. But if I'm going to spend good money with you, I want to see what I'm getting, especially if I'm treating a loved one or a family member, etc. It's, you know, that gift of experience is so, so uh, important. In terms of marketing, so you, you were saying earlier in the show that your, your fundamental challenge is that you're growing in a secondary market. I mean, you're competing with San Francisco, where, where I lived for a few years, and I know that's foodie heaven over there, and there's a lot of foodies. How are you going about promoting yourself other than what you did with the women or women's organizations how are you promoting yourself to the general public and to encourage people to come to Oakland I think two things so one is a lot of search engine optimization I've been doing some blog a little bit more blogging um, I know that's something I definitely want to do more of going forward in 2020 and that's why I have hired um, Chris Torres to you know help with that effort in getting more people from the city over to the town, as we like to call Oakland, the town. But then also, I, you know, something that was one of my big takeaways from arrival in Las Vegas last year, I had a great conversation with Douglas Quinby. And, you know, I said to him, brief conversation, I said, you know, Douglas, and this was the first time I've ever met him. And we had just kind of chatted a little bit. And I said, you know, I'm so frustrated because I'm going to all these workshops and I have a marketing background, like I'm doing this, like I'm active on social media, I'm doing a little bit of blogging, I'm taking hotel concierges and their event staff on free tours. Why is it not working a little bit more, especially in getting people from San Francisco over to Oakland? And he said to me, he goes, you got to physically bring them over, figure out how to physically bring them over. So I left Arrival Las Vegas. One of the workshops I went to was sort of how to look at TripAdvisor. I've been on TripAdvisor since the beginning and the number of TripAdvisor guests that I've received as well as other OTAs has been very minimal. And I think a lot of that is because people don't look at Oakland as a destination. I look to see how, what people come for when they come to the Bay Area and it's predominantly San Francisco. What do they want to see when they come to San Francisco? And some of the biggest things were, we want to see Alcatraz. We want to see the Bay. We want to go to the Ferry Building. We want to see the Bay Bridge, um, the Golden Gate Bridge, and we want to ride the San Francisco Ferry. Now that I'm the mother of a four-year-old, last year he was three, we do Adventure Day every Tuesday. That's the day that he is not in school. And many of our Adventure Days is riding the San Francisco Ferry. And I thought, huh, what if we start a tour in San Francisco and we can just take people on the ferry? I don't have to own my own boat. We literally have the transportation right there. And bring them to Oakland. And fortunately for me too, the stars were aligning because one of Oakland's most amazing chefs, Chef Tanya Holland, she's the owner of Brown Sugar Kitchen. She was start opening an outpost at the Ferry Building. This way, I can actually have a total Oakland-based tour where you start with a tasting in the Ferry Building. You do amazing buttermilk chicken sandwiches with her, beignets, grits. We'll walk through the ferry building, talk a little bit about the history of the building itself and the ferries and sort of you know how you know, the waterway was such a prominent um, transportation mode, especially before the bridges were built. 
you get on the ferry and now you're on a 30 minute, be- especially on a beautiful day, beautiful ride across to Oakland and you get to see Alcatraz. You get to see the San Francisco skyline. We go into the famous port of Oakland, which it's debated whether or not they are the inspiration of the at at walkers in Star Wars. But we get to talk about that. And then we go to Oakland. And then what's nice is that with this tour, if anybody, since again, my dominant customer base is locals, if anybody's local to the East Bay in Oakland, they don't have to go all the way to San Francisco and start. We can actually pick them up at the visitor center, visit Oakland in Jack London Square. And then we do all together, we do a three hour tour of the Jack London Square and um, the historic warehouse and brewing district. And that's kind of been my way to really market Oakland to people who are more outside the area. And that and that's where I do see more guests coming in now from TripAdvisor and Eventbrite, which we do post um, tours on Eventbrite. It's interesting to me. I, I definitely think it's it's a winning strategy. I, uh, re- well, a couple months ago now, went to New York City and I went on Tony's tour, A Slice of Brooklyn tours. He's a great guy and he does the same thing. So he picked us all up in Union Square, Manhattan in a bus and then got us over to Brooklyn. So that was very appealing because Oakland and Brooklyn are quite similar to me in in, in my life in a way that when I lived in San Francisco, I rarely went to Oakland. I went over there to watch the Raiders once, which was a fun day out. It's good that you got to see them now. (laughs) I know, I know. And it was the same thing with Brooklyn. I said to Tony, I said, I had one disastrous date in Brooklyn and I never went back. Uh, So with his tour, I got to see a lot more of Brooklyn. And of course, you know, he picks us up in Union Square. and And I think that's great what you're doing as well. Because I think once people, especially from out of town, you know, they have to start thinking about transportation and how to get somewhere, then it's harder to make that sale. And then I wonder, you know, just talking to you now, are you doing much with any corporates at all? Oh, absolutely. I mean, my corporate client base is 75% of my business now. That, and again, I think because I've also put more time and energy there because again, that's where the money is, to be honest with you. I'd rather spend time getting a group of 15 people than spending more time trying to just get two people who are visiting for, for the weekend. Because also they're locals and they're most likely going to be talking about my tour to their coworkers and then other colleagues who are looking for team building activities. So that is one of my priorities for next year is how do I get more of the corporate offices in San Francisco to want to come and take that tour with me? Because right now it's it, my, my business has been predominantly Oakland and East Bay companies um, contacting me. But I think with this tour especially, I can definitely bring over some more San Francisco-based companies. Yeah, and, and what I, I was thinking of two things, because I used to uh, be regional director for Booking.com out in San Francisco. So we had a lot of people based there, and I think there are even more now. But when I first came, so I moved to San Francisco from Sweden, didn't know my way around. And I came out for a week before I agreed to move and kind of you know find my own way around. But now I think if I was you know working there, I'd be saying, hey, anyone who's new to the company, I want to put them on this food tour, on this walking tour. I really want them to see the city or even to help them settle in. And I wonder if there's something you could do around that because so many of the tech companies are bringing people in from all around the world. That, that, oh, uh, Shane, you are, I think you're like burrowing into my mind right now because that is the one that is my first thing I'm doing after you know, you know starting this new year is reaching out to all of the people who have organized corporate tours with me in the last like two years and just saying, hey, who on your team organizes events? Is it a team? Because I I know I, I work with one corporation. They actually have a team dedicated in putting together team building and office groups for their entire company. And you know, once you find that person, I mean, I've now had four or five groups and Anna, she has booked all of them. That is definitely a goal for that. That is actively being worked on. Let's just say. Yeah. <laughs> no, I think it makes a lot of sense because also when when I was at Booking dot com, and we would have every month we would do a social event, you know, and I, I didn't always want it to be around about you know around alcohol and drinking. I wanted it to be fun. So something like a food tour is like, oh, that's a really fun idea, or a quarterly trip, or whatever. I, I definitely think you're onto something there. Did you know every weekday Shane curates the most interesting news articles in tours and activities and sends them out in a snappy daily digest? Grab your copy of the Torpreneur Daily Briefing at www.torpreneur.com. 
Are you working with OTAs at all? Yeah, I mean, very little. Um, really, TripAdvisor uh, or Viator and Expedia um, have just been like the two that I've been on. Um, but again, I just, I, to be honest, I haven't put much effort into really building that just because, again, when I look at my priorities, I do this business as a working mom with limited time because I do want to be actively engaged in my kid's life. When I look at my time that I have to currently give to my business, and I look at what gets me the most revenue, what's, what gives me the biggest ROI, it's private groups and locals versus you know mostly travelers who use OTAs. That being said, though, you know I have put my tours on Airbnb experiences, not all of them, but some, just because I also just use it as a discovery tool. So I have gotten guests who use Airbnb because you know they're young. They're the person who's their office manager or executive assistant who's tasked with finding you know a team building activity. And so they go on Airbnb and they find me. And I think it also helps too, because right now I'm not, there aren't very many activities, organized activities in Oakland per se. So I'm I'm very lucky to be sort of a pioneer in the market. But then also too, I've have had some guests say, Oh yeah, I found you on TripAdvisor. They have been great tools. I just, I'll be honest, I just I haven't invested as much time as I probably could. I will, I'll say could and not should right now. Yeah. No, I, I mean, that's the thing. We, we'll talk about this. I'm impressed that you are a busy, engaged mom and you know you have your adventure days and you're running a business. What tips would you have for other moms out there who, we have a lot of people who listen to Tourpreneur who really want to take the plunge and launch their own tour, but they're a bit nervous too, they're a bit anxious. And I, and I know that we'll have moms that are in the same boat. What would your advice be? Well, I will say moms and dads. I know dads are in there too. I think for me, it's building a business that really works for you if that's what you want. So if that's your goal. And for me right now, that's my goal. I will say, and I'll be honest, you know, it's, you know, the last couple of years are rough. I think any small business owner, whether you're a tourpreneur or you're opening up your own retail shop, you know, you hit the ups and downs. You kind of, you have those great highs where you're like, oh yeah, everyone's booking. Everyone's coming into my store. Everything is great. And then you'll have the lows of what am I doing wrong? I need to be spending more time. And so that's just kind of part of being an entrepreneur in general. For me, I consider success to be kind of the life that I have right now. There are days where I would love, you know, I'm in the middle of something and I want to get it done, but I look at the clock and I'm like, ah, oh, it's quarter after one. I got to go pick up my son from school and I don't get to finish what I have. And I'll admit on those days, you know what? An episode of Paw Patrol might go on the TV, but I know that that's balanced out because yeah, we do an adventure day every Tuesday. And then we also, you know, the nice thing is having Linda and Deborah as my tour guides, you know, they predominantly do my weekend tours. So um, right now I really only do private tours. So I've been able to kind of, you know, balance that and really just, you know, have the schedule that I want. But it's, you know, it's a constant, it's a constant struggle and a constant adjustment and having a really amazing husband to kind of, you know, talk you down from the ledge sometimes. But also remind you too, that when my kid is in full-time school, I won't have to say, man, I wish I started my business five years ago or eight years ago. I'll have been able to say, yeah, I started my business and watch it grow. Very inspiring. And I know you're going to inspire lots of moms and dads who are listening to the show to do it because it is a worry. It is a concern because you know, family first. And I love what you were doing in terms of blocking out your adventure day every week. And I stress that to other entrepreneurs that don't neglect your family, your partner, your kids, you know, at the expense of the business. I know it does consume so many hours of our time, especially the early days building up. But block out, you know, one day during the week where you have a date night or you take the kids out. I just think that and try and get off the internet. And I know it's hard, but I'll say, I'll say with that too, Shane, is that like, there are times where our adventure days, it, it's, it's self-serving a lot. You know, like, you know, we take the ferry, but I also take the ferry because that's research for my tours. Or, you know, this past week, our adventure day was my son and I, I took, put him in a wagon with a bunch of poinsettia plants and we were delivering holiday gifts to all of my tour partners. That was part of our adventure day. He loved it. He got to have cookies and he got to see all of our friends. And it's funny, we actually went to the original neighborhood Rock Ridge where we have the ice cream tour. If I can't find a babysitter, 
my son comes with me on the tour. Guests love it because he now knows what to do. He actually helps hand out the ice cream. He knows to say, my favorite ice cream is pink ice cream. And guests really love it because they have kids too. And, you know, part of it is you kind of can make your personal life also part of your professional life. I mean, my husband and I, we go out to dinner and it's research to kind of see who could potentially be on another tour. I get to meet a restaurateur and say, hey, I really love your food. You know, would you ever consider being part of a tour? There's ways to meld the two. I will say though, because I do like to be honest about this. I am very fortunate to have a partner that does pick up most of the financial needs of our house. But we always like to joke that my husband says all the time, there will be a day that I work for her. We have, you know, kind of a long-term plan in our future. I want people to know that too, because I think a lot of times people think, oh, you know, I can't do it. You know, you don't have that support. It is a lot harder when you don't have that support. And I know that. So I just want to be always be mindful that I'm very fortunate to have the situation that I have. Yeah, and I appreciate the the authenticity because most of the entrepreneurs we talked to were in exactly the same boat and supported by the families, especially when starting out until you know they start making profits. And I think it's important to acknowledge. Other than WordPress and Fair Harbor, are there any other tools or apps that are indispensable to you in terms of running your business? I feel like I'm pretty much on my phone all the time with all the apps. So all the social media apps, that's one thing I did take away a lot. Um, I've been, you know, active on Google My Business for over the past year, but you know, there was a great workshop at Arrival this year that really honed in on the importance of using Google My Business. So only if it's really relevant. If I post something on Instagram, I'm also posting it on Google My Business. Um, also, too, because I'm really trying to promote the private and corporate tours more. I've been more active on LinkedIn. I think that's also another tool. Um, Again, to kind of go back to the direct mail, for me, when I worked in corporate America, you know, you would buy a direct mailing list. You can can buy those things. Well, there's a lot of waste in those lists. So I want to, you know, as a small business owner with a limited marketing budget, I want to make sure that my my targeting is as targeted as possible. So I have no problem sometimes, especially when my son was little, an infant, you know, I'd wake up with him, you give him a nighttime feeding, and then it would be hard to go back to sleep. So I'd sit up and sit on LinkedIn. I'd, I'd kind of cross-reference, what are the largest companies in Oakland and the East Bay? And then I'd go on LinkedIn and find all of the people who are listed as executive assistants and office managers. And you kind of figure out their email address you figure out their mailing address and you kind of, you can target them that way. And that has actually, I mean, it's time consuming, but if you're a new mom and you can't sleep, it's a great way of using your time. There's stuff like that. I will say also, I listen to a lot of podcasts. I love this podcast, but I also love their side hustle school, which is a podcast I really love because I think it definitely plays into a lot of us tourpreneurs, but then also other industries. And then also how I built this. It's, you know, definitely more higher level. I mean, I don't know what woman entrepreneur does not admire Sarah Blakely of Spanx, but hearing stories like that or blow dry bar there, you can get really great nuggets. And I think that's one of the big things that, you know, and I, and I love about Arrival too, is, you know, sometimes, you know, a lot of people look at the big players, the Marriott's, the Universal Studios, the SeaWorld, and you're like, well, I can't relate to these people at all. But you actually can. There are things that you can take away from big corporations and big businesses that have made it big, and you can apply it to your own business. And that's that's what I think is really exciting about what we do as tourpreneurs. Absolutely. And I, and I second that with Chris's show at Side Hustle and also how I built this is just phenomenal. Because, you know, you see these big companies, like you say, and you think, oh, yeah, they've, been, they've got all this money and all this investment. But then you hear the scrappy stories of how they started out. And yeah, it's, it's very inspiring because you just think, yeah, that, that's me right now. That, that's what I'm doing. I'm fighting here in order to make a business and no one's doing us any favors. You know, it's all your own hustle in the early days. So I found them very inspirational. Do you have any final words of advice for entrepreneurs out there listening into the show? And now we have listeners in 110 countries, believe it or not. Any words of advice you would say to any tour operators out there, particularly any who, you know, might be struggling or, you know, we're in the new year and they're thinking, oh, you know, should I be doing it this year? What, what advice would you have for them? 
I guess I always just say this is like kind of become my mantra is my mantra in life is always just why not? Like try something new, go for it. I mean, you really, you only live once YOLO. I think YOLO is universal. And I say that as a, I guess, a very old millennial, 1980, just go for it. Try, you know, if you've been sitting on the idea, you know, why not just take a risk? I mean, what's the worst that can happen? You know, I say this to my tour guests all the time, especially guests who are like, I don't know if I want to try that. And I always say like Anthony Bourdain had a great quote. He said, anytime you go to a restaurant, try something on the menu that you've never had before. The best thing that can happen is you try it, you love it, and you have something that you'll love for the rest of your life. The worst thing that can happen is you're out a couple bucks. And so I think that applies to all of us. You know, there are so many different ways to try an idea that you have and also try in a way that makes sense for you. Like I feel, again, I feel very fortunate that I landed in Oakland because Oakland is a city that I feel like from a tourism destination is growing proportional to me. I started my business just before starting my family and you know no one was coming to Oakland and Oakland now is you know we, we it's a great town. Oakland was actually known as Brooklyn before it was known as Oakland. And so if you think about Brooklyn, I mean you talked about going to Brooklyn, Shane I mean, I grew up in New Jersey. I grew up right outside New York City. No one was going to Brooklyn in the 80s and 90s. And now look at it now. The fact that I feel like I can grow my business as my city is growing really puts a fire under under my seat because it's just like, wow, there, there can be so many things that I can do, you know, and I can try out new things, but I can try in a way that works for me in my life. So again, like, do what's best for you. You know your business, you know your goals, and you know your market best. So get out there. Why not? I absolutely echo everything you've saying. Lauren, thanks a million for coming on the show and, and sharing your story with us. I would love to check in with you 12 months down the road or maybe at arrival in Phoenix and hear about what exciting things that have happened to you in 2020. Thanks, Shane. And Happy New Year to everybody all around the world. Thanks, Lauren. Thank you. Thanks for listening to the Torpreneur podcast. Be sure to visit torpreneur.com to join the conversation and access the show notes, including links to the resources mentioned on today's episode. This is Torpreneur.